Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you once again to our Sunday morning here at the Digital Cathedral. Hope you've had a wonderful week and you're ready this morning to sit down and um, study a little bit. We're in a second, into the second part of a five-part series that we're doing that I'm calling uh, Unhook the Book. And what this series is all about is learning how to rightly divide or how to study your Bible, how to, how to look at Scripture. <clears throat> and one of the reasons I'm doing this is because the first of the year we're going to begin um, going through the books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians verse by verse and, and uh, uncover some things that Paul wrote that maybe we haven't even considered before. I really feel in those, in, those four, in those four books that Paul wrote, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, that there, are, there is a treasure of revelation uh, that either hasn't come to the surface yet or hasn't been emphasized in the body of Christ. And so I want, I want to go through those books systematically and deal with even some of the tough verses uh, that as grace people sometimes we're not sure how to respond to our friends when they ask us about some of those tough verses that would seem to indicate that uh, God is not all love, but he can be a, a vindictive deity that's just waiting for us to mess up so that he can reprimand and uh, eternally separate us from himself, which we know is absolutely not true. So we're going to look, look a little bit at how to unhook the book this morning. Let me just begin by saying that the Bible is probably the most misunderstood and yet often read book in in the planet, on the planet. And the reason that it's so misunderstood is because most, most of us, very few people, let me just put it that way, very few people have given much thought or study on how to unhook the book or how to, how to rightly divide the word, as Paul said, or how to read their Bible in a way that, that makes absolute sense to them and in a way that they can uncover for themselves, which is a huge key, uncover for themselves revelation. We have uh, over 40,000 denominations today. Think about that. 40,000 denominations, and there are thousands and thousands of non-denominational churches of all types and flavors, uh, all claiming as their foundation what the Bible, quote, clearly says. I've never, I've never been involved or been to a church or heard any pastor or teacher ever ever teach or preach, but what they want to be sure to let you know that what they're teaching is what the Bible clearly says. And yet no two of the 40,000 denominations or um, thousands and thousands of non-denominational churches believe exactly the same. And so as a result, we have people that are all over the spectrum theologically. We've got we have people, I have friends, I have pastor friends that take the Bible literally word for word. I mean, especially if you're in that King James only crowd, take the Bible just word for word, literally. They believe that it is literally just the way it's written in the King James version. That's the way that it should be. Then I've got other friends over here on the other side of the street that look at the Bible as being totally a metaphor. And when you uh, only assign a, a metaphorical re, um, interpretation of the Bible, it, it opens you up to um, putting a lot of meaning on things in the Bible that may not absolutely be what we've assigned them metaphorically. So you can assign all kinds of meanings to what you read when you only uh, go that route. Then I've got friends that are Calvinists. I've got friends that are Armenians and Universalists. And they're all putting on their particular lens, their theological lens, when they read the Bible, and they look at the Bible through their particular theological lens, and what they're really trying to do is to look for backup proof from the Bible to reinforce what they already believe. So we, we have made, uh, I don't, it was never intended to be this way, but we have actually made the Bible the most divisive, uh, argued book on the planet. We have no other book on our shelf that has caused such division as the Bible. And it's not the Bible's fault. It's because we haven't known how to unhook the book. So we're going to look a little bit at that today. Last week we got into it just a little bit. And I hope that the first thing that you realize from the teaching last week, and if you're just joining us in this series, you might want to go back and look at that first one because we laid some, some foundation. But I hope from last week's teaching that you realize um, that there are actually two covenants in the Bible. There's an old covenant and a new covenant. And these two covenants are actually <clears throat> not related to one another. They're not related at all. The old covenant and the new covenant 
are addressed to two separate people groups, two separate uh, emphasis, and there's two different reasons why uh, we have them today. The Old Testament was directed to the Jews and the covenant of law that they had to the Jews. The New Covenant is directed to all nations, and it carries with it a revelation of grace. So when you're reading the Bible, you have got to know which covenant I am reading. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that more and more over this five-week series and draw some more distinctions as we go, because this is one of the major fundamental problems is we don't know what is Old Covenant, we don't know what is New Covenant. And I don't want to get into next week's teaching, but it may surprise you next week when we talk about what actually is Old Covenant and what is New Covenant. But the question I want to deal with today when we, when we read the Bible, discerning which covenant we read, I want, the question I want to deal with today is this. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? I, I, and I want you to mem always remember, also keep in the back of your mind, that the Bible is written for you, but the entire Bible is not written to you. Now that's, a, that's an important point to remember. Let me just say that again. Always remember that the entire Bible was written for you, but not the entire Bible was written to you. So what we want to talk about today is, when we read the Bible, is, is this, is this what, that what I'm reading? Is it talking to me, or is it talking to some, somebody else? And I think Paul does some good clarification on that. And we're going to look at a number of scriptures today. If you come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to see uh, what Paul had to say about that very point in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. <clears throat> Paul says this, Now all these things happen to them, speaking about uh, in the Old Testament, speaking about the Old Covenant. All these things happen to them as, as examples. And they were written for our admonition or for our teaching upon whom the end of the ages would come. So what, what's Paul saying here? Paul is saying that everything that we read in the Old Covenant is, is valuable. We can learn from it. It was written to us for our admonition, for us to be taught from. It was given to us as an example over here in the New Covenant upon whom the end of the ages would come. So the Old Covenant was, was called for people to do their part and God would do his part. That, that is this, uh, one of the chief distinctions between Old Covenant and New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the people were called on, it was their choice, their decision, to make a covenant with God where they would agree to do their part and then God would do his part. Let me take you back to Mount Sinai. Do you remember, if you read in your Old Testament, where Moses stood down at the bottom of the mountain and God was wanting the people to come up to the top of the mountain for fellowship and relationship. God was looking for a people that he could have relationship with. And all the people saw the smoke and, and heard the noise coming out of the, the top of Mount Sinai. And they told Moses, Moses, look, we're not going up there. But if you go up there and find out what he wants, and you come back down and tell us what he wants, we make a commitment that we will do it. So Moses went to the top of the mountain and came back, you know, with the Ten Commandments, ten. And maybe in week four or five, we'll get in this a little further. But out of that 10 grew 613 more laws that the Old Testament folks had to keep in order to be blessed by God. And so the Old Covenant called on people to do their part. And if they would do their part, God would do their part, his part. Let me, uh, let me read it for you directly from Deuteronomy. If you come back to the Old Covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 28. <clears throat> and this highlights exactly what I'm saying to you. Moses, in, in writing Deuteronomy, uh, said this, Now it shall come to pass, if you, this is your part, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and obey carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, then the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you because you obey the voice of of God. Now, do you, do you see what's going on here? The, 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 the deal was this. If you obey all the covenants, if you obey all of, all of the laws, then God would bless you. It was you do, and then God will do. But the flip side of that coin is this. 
If the Old Testament people were negligent, if they were rebellious, if there was any reason uh, that they didn't keep up their end of, of the covenant, then God was not obligated to do his part. And so that was where the rub came because none of them could keep their part. And so God, God spells it out in verse 15 of that same chapter, Deuteronomy 28. He says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, then all these curses will come on you. So not only would they not be blessed if they didn't keep them, but they faced a dilemma. They, they, they would have, uh, uh, they would face problems. They would face, uh, you know, just this gigantic, uh, unbelievable, unmovable rock of, of God saying, look, you didn't do your part, so not only am I not doing my part, but you're going to have a big problem if you don't keep it. So it's, it's important to remember this question. Are you talking to me? Uh, the Old Covenant was addressed to those people, the Jews, and not you. Uh, it, it, let me say it again, because some of you have never realized this. I know some of you that are, are watching Digital Cathedral are, uh, have come through a, a lot of depth, uh, depth understanding that some of the newer people haven't. So let me just, let me just say it uh, plainly. The Old Covenant was not written to you. Now, does that mean we can't learn from it? No, we can learn from it. We can learn from their experience. That's what Paul was saying over uh, in the scripture we read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, all these things were for our examples. We can use them to teach us. It was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. You understand what I'm saying? You can learn from their experience, but it wasn't written to you. It wasn't written for you to follow or to keep. Now, the new covenant, when we come to the new covenant, that is not a covenant of you do your part, then God does his part. And there's a huge misunderstanding still in the church today because we have been greatly influenced in the church today still by the old covenant that was never intended for us. So when we come to the new covenant, because of our influence from the old covenant, we're still looking for us to do our part, us to believe, us to have faith, us to, to invoke an action in order to invoke the blessing of God. The new covenant is not a covenant of you do, then God will do his part. And, and I hope I can remove any fog in your understanding today because as we move through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, much of what we read in those books is going to be written to us. And as we, as, we, as we discover what has been written to us, we're going to see that everything that had to do with us being obedient to be blessed by God has been extracted out. In fact, it's the opposite end of the coin. It's the other side of the scale. And if you don't understand this, that the old covenant was you do, God blesses. New covenant, God has already done, therefore you are blessed. Not based upon your obedience, old covenant. Not based on your actions, old covenant. But based on God's goodness and God's love to us. So we've got to get this basic understanding down because it affects how you read your Bible. It affects how you unhook the book. It affects how you see people, how you see yourself, how you see God. It, it, it creates, if we don't get the distinction between the Old, Cust Old Testament, the Old Covenant of, of works and blessing by obedience... And new covenant, blessing apart from works and obedience, a covenant of grace, then you're, you're never going to pull out of the new covenant the depth that you need to pull out. So here's what I'm trying to say. You had no part in inst instituting or uh, uh, making the new covenant a valid covenant. When Jesus said, it is finished, he fulfilled our part and he fulfilled his part of the covenant. So what, what's left for us to do? The only thing that's left for us to do is to celebrate and enjoy the covenant that Jesus instituted, Jesus performed, and Jesus has executed. It's not based on your performance and your works. So when we come back to De Deuteronomy, when, we, when, we, when we're going to unhook the book and we come back to a scripture like Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2, 
where God says, if you hearken to my voice, you obey all my commands, all my statutes, if you do that, then I will bless you. If you're obedient, then I'll bless you. When we come back to a scripture like that, instead of looking at it through the lens of what we must do, we look at it through the lens of the new covenant and, and we see through the lens of grace that Jesus was my obedience because in him, in this one man, the entire new covenant was, was fulfilled. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 30, I probably should drop this in here right, right, right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 30 says this, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So he is your obedience. He is your righteousness. He is your sanctification. He is your redemption. He has already become those things as you. So when we look at the old covenant, the old covenant didn't have Jesus doing that as us. It was, a, it was incumbent on you to do it as you in order to be blessed by God. Now in the new covenant, we find that Jesus has already done these things. Therefore, we are already blessed by God. So you say, well, how is the old like the new? It's, it isn't like the new. The old is entirely different. What, what is the common ground of the Old Testament with the New Testament? There isn't any common ground. And that's, that's the point that we have to, have to get down deep within us when we begin to unhook the book. Because honestly, we have not separated the covenants and understood the basic motivation of the covenants and what God was trying to accomplish through those two covenants. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. Let's come over there, see what we can pick out of here. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 says this. In that he says, now listen to this carefully, a new covenant he has made. And in making the new covenant, says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what has become obsolete and is growing old is ready to vanish away. All right, now let me run that by you again. I don't know how many of you in the digital cathedral have your, your Bible at, at your uh, coffee table or wherever you're listening. But he says, a new covenant he has made. And by making the new covenant, he says he has made the first one obsolete. All right, it's obsolete. When something's obsolete, it's not, there's no, no, no value to it anymore. Now, in the new covenant, that's for Jew and Gentile. He's made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to pass away. Here's the point. There is no old covenant anymore. It's gone. It's obsolete. It's finished. Now, let me, let me put the caveat on. Does that mean we can't learn from it? No, of course we can learn from it. Does that mean there's not wisdom in the Old Covenant? Of course there's wisdom there. I, I went through um, several years where I would read a, a chapter of Proverbs every day. And it goes back to uh, some training I had at Bill Gothard. That, that may be a familiar name to some of you old timers, but there used to be what was called a basic youth conflict seminar. Bill Gothard put it on. One of the things Bill Gothard was strong on was pulling wisdom out of the, the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters of Proverbs, so you could read one every day. And I did that. And to be honest with you, I pulled a lot out of it. There's a, there is wisdom. There's insight. There's, there's revelation in, in the Old Testament. But it is obsolete. It has passed away. It is, it, is, it is not in force for Jew or Gentile. So we, we, we see the distinction between the old and the new. The New Testament is what the Father through the Son in the Spirit has already done for you. And by already doing it for us, it means that he has taken the initiative. A distinction between old and new in a new, new covenant, God takes the initiative. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus said, you haven't called, you haven't, uh, called me, I have called you. All right? I've called you, therefore you responded. In the new covenant, he always takes the initiative. Now in the old covenant, what part must you play? What could you do? To make God happy. That was the question you had to deal with in the Old Covenant. What can I do to obey God, please God, 
uh, live up to the standard that God expects. And then when I do that, then God responds to me. So in the old covenant, we initiate by our obedience, by our life, by our uh, obeying the laws and the commands. When we obey, then God blesses. So we initiate in the old, God responds. In the new covenant, God initiates and we respond. Do you, do you see the difference? In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, even in the old covenant, they had a little bit uh, of, of understanding about this. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, it says this. This, this illustrates the old covenant well. He says, and when you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. How many times I, I've used some of these Old Testament scriptures in days gone by, and it, looking back, it's almost embarrassing. But what, what he's saying in Jer what Jeremiah is saying, look, if you will seek me, Old Covenant, you initiate. If you will seek me with your whole heart, become a God chaser, then you will find me. Now, what happens if you don't seek him with your whole heart? He, then you have this sense of separation. Then you don't find him. So we still use stuff like that in the church today to um, instruct people and really try to motivate them to seek God, to, to really look for God. And if you look for God, you uh, really seek his presence, then he said you'd find him. That's Old Testament. That's Old Covenant. You initiate God responds. In the, in the New Covenant, God's, Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He initiates. And whether you respond or not has nothing to do with, how, with the initiation that he has get already given to us. You know, when, when, you, when you look at these things from the Old Covenant about us initiating and God responding, it shouldn't, shouldn't have taken man long to figure out that he couldn't keep his end of the covenant. That was the problem. And God knew that the whole time. And let me go back to what I said earlier. Man was the one that requested this. God, didn't, God never wanted an old covenant. God always wanted relationship, fellowship with man. God always wanted to initiate. God designed us to be responders. But because of what they desired, God said, okay, I will go that way with you. God, in the long run, in the long journey, God knew this wasn't going to work. He already knew it. And it shouldn't take in man long enough to understand that you can never seek God with your whole heart. Because when you think you're seeking him with your whole heart, you'll stand back and say, you know what? I could have I sought him a little more. <clears throat> if I prayed 20 minutes, I could have surely prayed 30. Maybe if I'd have prayed at 45 minutes and really sought him on that level, I would have found him. I would have I bumped into him somehow. Maybe I didn't seek him hard enough. And so we, we find that it's a never-ending black hole of never doing enough. The new covenant, on the other hand, the new covenant is not like the old one that God made with Israel alone. The new covenant was made between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you and I had no part in making it, no part in keeping it, and no part in executing it. What you and I are is a beneficiary, as Gentiles, we're beneficiaries to the new covenant, to the eternal covenant that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit made. The new covenant is, is your inheritance. Your inheritance can be summed up very simply. Your inheritance is complete inclusion in what they fulfilled together. All right. Now, you know what an inheritance is. An inheritance is normally we think of money or property that you receive when another dies. If your um, mother and father pass away and maybe they left you an inheritance of, you know, the family house or a car or whatever, that's, that was your inheritance. And it came when they passed. Your inheritance is an inclusion in what they fulfilled Together. Let me give you a couple of verses on inheritance because I, I, I want you to get this down tight as we unhook the book starting next month and start on the book of Galatians. <clears throat> You're gonna, you, you need to understand that as we uncover things, this belongs to you because of what Jesus has done, what the Father through the Son and Spirit has already accomplished. They've come and they said, look, this is your inheritance. So let me just give you a couple of verses that you can underline and keep in mind 
and a couple of them are in the, the, the books that we're going to look at. Let's look first of all at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I, wanna, I just want to uh, put a couple of these verses down with you so that you'll, you'll catch them as we come back through them again. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse, let, let's read verse uh, 11, verse 11. And in him also, and in him we have obtained an inheritance. You got it? Now here's the inheritance. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his will. So we're going to get into this when we get over into Ephesians. But you have an inheritance. And the inheritance is your predestination to fulfill his purpose which he made, not asking you, but he made according to the counsel of his will. I can't, I, I can't stop on these verses and, and teach on them, but I just, I'm going to drop the words inheritance that I want you to pick up on, all right? Because we're going to come back in months ahead. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possessions to the praise of his glory? Then we read down again in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I, I, I can't, I got to stop right there at 18 for just a second. He's saying, guys, I want you to get your eyes open. And this is what I want to get done when we get through uh, our, our four books that Paul wrote. I want your, the eyes of your understanding, like he said in verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that they would open up and you would see what your inheritance is. We, we've not emphasized, we've not majored on the inheritance. We've still taken some of the old covenant and tried to weave it into the new and created a, a religion that is nothing like what the new covenant lays out for us. All right, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Over to the right, just a little bit. Colossians chapter 1, and let's read verse uh, 12. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So he's the one that qualified us. We, did, we didn't qualify us. He qualified us to be a partaker of the inheritance. Again, we're going to get into some of this. Chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you, you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And then let's, let's turn back to what one of the original apostles said in Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. Why, why did he birth us again through the resurrection? Begotten means to be born again. It's the word and in a gale. It means to be born again. You were born again at the cross. You weren't born again when you prayed to prayer. You were born again at the cross. Why did he, why did he initiate the birthing of you again? Do you remember what I said? That he is the initiator of the new covenant. Why did he, why did he, Initiate it. Why did he execute it? Verse 4, so that you can have an, an inheritance that is uncorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, that is reserved in heaven or that dimension of life. He's not talking about the sweet by and by. He's talking about a dimension of consciousness that's reserved in a dimension of consciousness that as the eyes of your understanding are opened, you will realize exactly what it is. So what, what's left? There's nothing left for you to do. In the Old Covenant, it was all about what you do. In the New Covenant, there's nothing left for you to do but to say thank you and enjoy your inheritance. You have an inheritance. Now, that's good news. That, that is the gospel of good news that we have not used as our tool of evangelism. That's the best tool of evangelism that you is that they didn't, they didn't earn it, they didn't uh, merit it, they didn't qualify for it, they didn't execute the, 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 the covenant. It belongs to them. So the old covenant, you know what the old covenant did? The old covenant gave us an invoice for sin because we couldn't keep the law. 
Jews could not keep the law. Even as New Testament people, when we try to make the Old Testament, we think the Old Testament is talking to us, <clears throat> and it's just not written for our example or to teach us. We think it's written to us. It, it shouldn't take us very long to realize we can't keep this thing. The Old Testament gave us a, 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 an invoice for sin, but then the New Covenant gives us a receipt for sin that says paid in full. So these covenants have totally contrasting voices. The way they talk to you, the way they minister to you. Uh, in, in, John, in John chapter 10, if you'll come over there with me for a minute. John chapter 10, Jesus, Jesus addresses the voice of the old covenant and the voice of the new covenant. In John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Verse 6, Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, who is the they that's talking about that, that did not understand? If you come back up to verse 40 of the previous chapter, some of the Pharisees who were with Jesus heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? So Jesus goes into a little dissertation in, in chapter 10 to show them how blind they have been, the voice that they have been listening to, and how they could come out of it. And, it, and Jesus does it kind of in, in parable in parable fashion. So he's speaking, verse 40, to the Pharisees. And in verse 7, he begins to contrast the two voices, the voice of the Pharisee, or the, law, the voice of law, and the voice of Jesus, or the voice of grace. In verse 7, he says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The thief that Jesus is talking about here that takes from us and gives no life is the thief is the law. And he's directing it at the Pharisees who, who were tried their best to keep the law. Paul called it a covenant of death. There's no life in it. So when Jesus says that the thief, the law, comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. It does, it does the stealing, the killing, and the destroying because you're not able to keep it. And we read in the Old Covenant that if you don't keep it, then these problems arise in your life. You don't enjoy the life. And that's what Jesus was driving at here. So Jesus was saying, His sheep, those that hear the voice of grace, those that hear the voice of the shepherd, which he does everything for the sheep. That's the voice of grace. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Man, there's so much in all of this that we could get into. Well, I, I'm trying to get you to see there, there's two voices Jesus is contrasting here. The voice of law, which is the voice of death. It steals, it kills, it destroys. It was being uh, voiced by the, the Pharisees and they didn't want to hear that. Then Jesus says, here's the voice of grace. It's the, it's the shepherd. It's me. My voice is the voice of grace. It's the voice of goodness. It's the voice of reflecting who the Father really is, a Father of unconditional love. And he says, those that hear my voice, in verse 4 and 5, those that hear the voice of grace don't follow the voice of law. The voice of a stranger, it becomes strange. The law becomes very strange. And you look back on your life once you really tap into grace and you go, how in the world did I ever get sucked into thinking I could follow that? And there's no way that you're going to go back. It'd be, it's the voice of a stranger. You would not hear it anymore. You don't hear it. The voice of law, however, when it's confronted with grace, and some of you are going to relate to this because you have confronted maybe even unknowingly, your friends that are still hip deep in law or mixed your message, and you've talked about grace, whenever law hears the voice of grace, it reacts the same way. In verse 19, therefore there was a division again among the Jews because of what Jesus said. And some of them said, this guy's got a demon, he's mad. Why do you listen to him, right? So, uh, the voice, the voice of law never really wants to receive the voice of grace when it's totally entrenched. 
Now here's some voices that you're going to have to um, determine what to listen to. If it's, if it's to you or just for you. Let, let, me, let me give you some contrasting voices. And the reason I want to do this is because some of the couple of verses I'm going to give you, you heard in your church that was supposedly a New Testament church that was taught to you that this was incumbent on you. And I want you to make a determination. For example, in Isaiah chapter 59, in Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 2, um, Isaiah chapter 59, let me just hop over there. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 says this, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins has hidden his face from you. <clears throat> Do you ever hear that in church, that sin has separated you from God? In your disobedience, his face, he, doesn't, he can't look on sin. You can't, he can't look on sin. He's separated from you. It, it, it's, it's, it comes from Isaiah 59 too. Your sins has hidden his face from you. He can't look on it. He can't look on you when you sin. He's separated from you. Your sins have separated you from him. All right. Now that's one voice. Then we read over in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> and let me just bottom line it for you. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he goes through a whole sequence of things. And the bottom line is, Paul says, nothing can separate you from God. So Isaiah says, sin separate. Paul says, nothing separates. Now, which, which voice is to you? All right, now you got to make a determination. I, I would say that the new covenant, Paul's voice is to us. Nothing can separate us. But when you, when you go into a church and, and you hear the pastor or the teacher or the guy on TV or whatever say, your sins have separated you, and then you, he turns around and gives you a, a verse from Romans 8, nothing can separate you. Do you see how we've created confusion in the minds and the hearts of people? We've created double-mindedness. Here's, here's one we heard a lot. Jeremiah chapter 17 and, and verse 9. Jer Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can trust it? We've, heard, we've had that pounded into us a lot, haven't we? Now here's what, here's what Paul said. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful. It's wicked. You can't trust it. Now Paul, Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 6. See, you, I, I, I'm pointing these out because I, I want you to get, as we unhook the book, you're going to have to discard some of Scripture that was not written to you. Remember, the Old Testament was written only to the Jews. It was never written for you. You were never bound by it. It was not part of you. But in Christianity, we've made it a part of us. We've tried to weave it back in, make it all fit together. Here's what Paul says about the heart. Chapter 6, verse 17. But God, be thankful that though you were slaves of sin, yet now you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you have been delivered. So, 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 so Paul says that our heart is the motivator for obedience. He says you obeyed this from the heart. He said, so God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart. Now, how could you obey from the heart if your heart was desperately wicked above all things and you couldn't trust it? So which one is it? Paul says our heart is the motivator for obedience. Jeremiah says it's exceedingly wicked and it is of no value and you've got to watch it. You can never trust it. One, one is to you. One could be for you. But there's only one that's to you. And that's New Covenant, right? New Testament. And we're going to get into next week what that really means. All right, Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel had some ideas uh, on this. Uh, let me turn over there. Ezekiel chapter 36. A lot of these verses I know that, you, that you've already uh, heard or you're very familiar with, but I think that we, we've got to get it. Now, Ezekiel understood. He had an insight that, that God needed to do what man could not do. So Ezekiel has a forward look and he reveals something that God says. And Ezekiel says, this is God speaking. God says this, I will give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of, of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and because and cause you or give you the power to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now, Ezekiel had an insight into the new covenant of God being the initiator. Uh, in my Bible, I took all of the, where God said, I will, I will, I will, and as a result of that, you respond, and this was what happens when you respond. That's a great insight that Ezekiel had. So Ezekiel understood. He had, he had a revelation on it. He said, look, we can't do our part. So God comes in and does for us what we can't do. That's what grace is all about. God doing for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. So who's right? Isaiah says sin separates us. Paul says nothing separates us. Jeremiah says your heart is evil. Paul says your heart is the motivator that causes you to do good. So who's right? Let me just say, they're both, they're all right. You have to understand they were speaking to different people under different covenants. We need to listen. And when we read scripture, we need to read it through the eyes of grace. Knowing, the verse I read earlier, that Jesus has become for us our obedience. He has become our sanctification, our redemption. He, be, he became those things not for us. He became those things as us. That's the lens that you need to look. If you're going to really unhook the book, get, get the Bible doing what it was intended to do, then you're going to have to begin to look through the eyes of love and grace into the old covenant. So when God says, if you obey me, you can say, I've obeyed because Jesus obeyed. Jesus obeyed as me. I've obeyed. I've fully kept. I've done everything. Therefore, the blessings flow, right? If you're going to look at it, Old Covenant. New Covenant, God says, look, I'm going to do for you what you can't do. Ezekiel saying, I'm going to put a new heart, new spirit, cause you, I will empower you to walk pleasing before me. I'll do all of that. So all that you and I have in the New Testament is an inheritance. You didn't do anything to earn or, or, or merit an inheritance. It was given to you. Now here's, here's one I taught many times. I, I, I taught this so many times. This, this is Old Covenant, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God says, if my people which are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, and if they will pray. I used to use this all the time when I was trying to get corporate prayer groups together. But we need to push in, we need to pray. If my, if my people which are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray, and if they will turn from their wicked ways, then they will hear from heaven. Do you see the Old Covenant in that? You do, and then God responds. <clears throat> the problem was we couldn't pray enough. We couldn't repent enough. You know, we just thought, well, the reason it's, this isn't working is because we're not doing enough. God, God says, I'll bless you if. That's old covenant. There are two sides to the proposition. If, if you do this, then God will do his part. It, it creates God chasers. But what, what does the new covenant say? In, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 4, it's the end of the verse says that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So watch, watch this. The voice of the Old Testament says, if you repent, God will show you kindness. Now watch the shift. The New Covenant, the voice of the New Testament says, God shows us his kindness. Then as a result of that, we repent. The old covenant, you initiate, God responds. New covenant, God initiates. When we have the goodness of God, that creates the atmosphere and the desire to repent. God initiates and you repent. Or you change your mind. That's what it, what's getting at. One is a voice to you. The other is a voice for you. The voice that is to you is the voice of the new covenant. So when you know which covenant is speaking to you today, it gives you a right mind. It gives you a right outlook. It, it allows you to see people, see yourself, to see God in the right light. It gives you a, a, a right mind. It, 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 you begin to see yourself like God sees you. 
That's the beauty of God initiating, is that you begin to see you like God sees you. Because God says, I'm going to pour goodness on you. So you begin to see, okay, I'm deserving of God's goodness. I'm, I deserve the inheritance, not my, based on my merit, but because of his love and his goodness. Are you speaking to me? <laughs> covenant of law or covenant of grace? What you read may be for you, but let me just say it again. It might have some value, might have some insight, might have some wisdom, but it might not be for you written to you. The understanding of Scripture is if it's talking to you or if it's not talking to you is, is immeasurable. That's an immeasurable benefit, knowing if it's talking to me or it's just something for me. We have a covenant through Christ. We don't have a contract. The old covenant was more of a contract. A contract is 50-50. You know, if you don't do your part of the contract, then I have to be my part of the contract. If, you're, if you don't do your part, I'm not obligated to do my part. We don't have a, a contract. We have a covenant. A covenant, listen, here's a huge difference. If you haven't heard anything I've said, hear this. A covenant is two people making a bilateral agreement with a unilateral commitment. What does that mean? It means the covenant is binding even if one of the two does not hold up their end. Let me, let, let me run that by you again. A covenant is two people making a bilateral agreement with a unilateral commitment. So if you and I have a covenant and I don't keep my part, you still have to keep your part. You're not freed from it. A covenant says, if you don't do your part, I still do mine. Now that's what the, that's what the new covenant is. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Here's the covenant. Paul says, uh, told Timothy, even if we are faithless, we don't keep our part. He still remains faithful. He keeps his part. That's, that's what a covenant of grace looks like. God's, God gives you 100% what you don't deserve by marriage. Because I'll tell you right now, if, if it was a contract, you're going to let your part down. But it's not a contract. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bilateral agreement. But there's a unilateral commitment to it. God gives you 100% of what you don't deserve by merit or by, by works because it's your inheritance. Because he's made covenant with the son to include you. You were included in the son's obedience, in the son's righteousness, in the son's life. He included you in the son before the foundation of the world. He nailed this thing down and made it tight. Jesus, let me say again, Jesus did not live for you. He lived as you in the eyes of the Father. As he is, so are we in this present world. That's your inheritance. Are you talking to me? Or are you talking something for me? If what you read tells you how much you're like Jesus, it's talking to you. If you, if you read in the scripture how perfect you are, how holy, righteous, redeemed, justified, reconciled, and accepted you are, if you pull those things, and we're going to pull a lot of them out of those four books, then that's talking to you. If what you read tells you how much you must do to be like Jesus, it's not written to you. There might be some instruction, might be some wisdom, might be something we can pull out of it, but it's not written to you directly. All right, you got that down for this morning? All right, hold tight. There's two covenants. One is written for you. One is written to you. It's imperative that you answer the question, is this talking to me or is this written for me? God has made a with you, not a contract. Even if you were to let down your side, which you can't, you cannot let your side down because Jesus fulfilled it as you. It's already done. It's already sealed. When Jesus said, it is finished, there were a myriad of things he meant. He meant the old covenant was done. It had passed away. And by it is finished meant the new covenant was now instituted. It was now put into place. You are now delivered from the have to. You were brought into the, to the want to as you recognize his grace and his goodness towards you. All right, you got that down? Wednesday night, we'll talk about a little bit more. Next Sunday morning, we'll go part three. And what I want to talk to you about next Sunday morning is what is really old covenant and what is new covenant. When does the new covenant really begin? 
Some of you are going to be shocked at what we discover next Sunday morning. So we'll see you then. You have a wonderful week. And rightly divide the word. Read your Bible through the lens of grace and love and goodness. And know that he's speaking to you. We'll see you next time. God bless. We thank you for being with us today on the Digital Cathedral. We trust that today's teaching helped you in your journey to the abundant life Jesus has freely given to all. If you would like to help support us in spreading the gospel of grace, you can do so by going to donkeithley.com to make your donation. We thank you for your prayers and continued monthly support and look forward to seeing you again next week at the Digital Cathedral.